unless specifically indicated otherwise, the content expressed are my views only and not necessarily those of LifePro Asset Management, LLC. The content presented is in no way an investment advice, solicitation, or an offer to sell securities or investment advisory services. The material is provided for general information and educational purposes based upon publicly available information from sources believed to be reliable. I cannot assure the accuracy or completeness of these materials. As such, the information in these materials may change at any time without notice. Reference to these discussions about IULs and annuities or fixed insurance products. Investments on fixed insurance products are different from investments in the stock market. Any guarantees provided by a fixed insurance product cannot be assumed to be guaranteed for any other investment. Welcome to the Rock My Finances show on K4HD Radio and Talk 4 TV, where we put the fun in finance. Join powerhouse Jennifer Jost, CDFA, CMC, and private wealth advisor as she collaborates with you to create clarity, control, and confidence with your money, your way. It's not about the zeros. So what is it all about? Let's find out. Now here's your host and weekly friend, Jennifer Jost. I'm back. So glad you're here with us today. It's going to be a great show. So what have you experienced in the world of divorce? So I've done this uh, three times, I know, and I'm not done yet. Love men, love marriage, uh, love the whole situation. So first time uh, ended in catastrophe. We were filing for divorce and going through the divorce process. So that was the first time we did not end up fully divorced uh, since of my um, tragedy during that time. So go back and listen to Divorce Equals Death episode on the podcast if you want to hear what happened with that. Second marriage, uh, the father of my children, Journey and Parker. We did a cordial uh, divorce, like a financial divorce, and we went through a uh, paralegal and then went to an attorney to complete it all. And... Um, then we had most of it done. And then when we, and we still lived together for two years. So after that two years, when we were completely done, hired another attorney to, uh, go through the, you know, the formalities of completely divorcing. And, um, that was, you know, what it is, child support, custody, all that great stuff that everybody wants to know about assets, property division, all that third time, um, we did a mediator. And it went really well. And so, of course, it's uncomfortable and all of that stuff, but we agreed on everything already. And so it was just going through the formalities of, um, a, you know, a few things because we kept mostly everything separate. So I've been around the block a little bit with divorce. So because of that, I attracted a lot of clients doing the same thing, of course, because what you know, you kind of put out there and then that's who finds you. So I became a certified divorce financial analyst and I have a whole side gig doing that and helping people separate property and helping attorneys and helping attorneys with their clients on the emotional side of things because they literally don't have time to help them with the emotional side of things. And I met Karen Gallagher. I'm so excited. She is such an amazing attorney. So welcome, Miss Karen Gall- Gallagher to my show. Karen Gallagher Costa, because she's remarried as well. Congratulations. I'm so glad to have you. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me today. And yes, the Absolutely. divorce attorney did eventually get remarried. It can happen. <laughs> it can happen. How long have you been married now? Three years. We did the 10 person COVID wedding. So we managed to squeak it in right under the wire there and going on three years now. Awesome. Congratulations. I so love that. I love that. Thank you. So I'm glad as a divorce attorney, you did experience a divorce in the beginning so that you have some experience from it before or during or what, however that ended up in your career. Tell us a little bit about that part. Well, I ended up, I was married. I took the bar exam, eight months pregnant, had my daughter, Andrea. And then three months after she was born, my husband uh, was a switch, uh, what they call a switch flip schizophrenic. So he was there one day and gone the next. So I'm there with a three month old, no job and a husband that is not recognizable to me anymore. So what I ended up doing was going through a divorce and uh, it was kind of a long process and more adversarial than it needed to be. So I decided to switch from tax law, which I was doing at the time, into family law so I could take a more mediation approach so people wouldn't be putting themselves through all this stress or children through all this stress. And they would be you know, able to get things done more quickly, easily, and more importantly, less expensively because it's a very expensive process. Yes, it absolutely can be for sure. 
So I appreciate that. So you've, you've gone through it yourself. And so you wanted to do more of the mediation type side of things. But then as I know, because I have referred you so many times that um, you are also a pit bull. Tell me more about that as well. A little bit. I, I try to keep the gloves off. You know, I do it as easy as possible. The first thing I do is sit down with everyone, try to see what we can agree on. So if we are going to go to court and fight, we're going to fight over, you know, two things, not 27. Uh, but sometimes you have people on the other side that just don't want to compromise or they need to judge to tell them. And then I'm happy to take the gloves off. I actually had a funny story with one client. She said she was so nervous going into court. She goes, his attorney is just so in your face and you're so nice and, and kind. And, and thoughtful. She goes, but it's like you got a personality transplant when you went through the metal detector because you were just all up in his face. You wouldn't take any grief from him. And it was just, you know, I was so scared. But then after I saw that, I'm like, oh, great. I have the perfect attorney because she doesn't ramp it up. But if she needs to, boy, can she do it. And that's the perfect attorney because you never really know what's going to happen right. until you, they are the uh, opposing side or any of us. We don't know how any of us are going to handle this until you're actually going through the process. And so right. people that are listening, if you've gone through a divorce, you understand it. If you have friends going through it, you cannot understand it until you've actually gone through it. And then each one is different and similar. So we're going to talk more generalities here because obviously we don't know everyone's individual, but we love stories too, Karen. So we have <laughs> love that. So there's a few things that um, uh, let's start from the very beginning of the process. Let's say most of my coaching clients are women and most of my advising clients are couples. And I always say you're going to have more sex and more money if I am your financial advisor because I want you together. Have good on both. <laughs> We want it all, right? So, um, so tell me if um, we are maybe even just contemplating, or even prenuptial, or anything at all. Like, what are some things that you want to make sure that you have in place before you jump into the process? I say before you even tell the other person you're going to be divorced, you want to have your financial paperwork because the one thing I'm sure you found out with the courts too. It doesn't matter what you think you have. It doesn't matter what you know you have. It matters what you can prove you have. So I tell people get copies of all the financial paperwork, keep an eye on the mail, get 401k statements, bank account statements, credit card statements. The last two years of tax returns, including all the attachments such as the W-2s and 1099s. Get all that before you say anything and not only get it, don't stick it in a drawer in your house, maybe keep it at a friend's house. But what I tell people to do is to scan it and email it to themselves because your spouse may be able to destroy the paperwork at your house or your friend's house, but he can't destroy the entire internet. So if you've emailed it to yourself, you can go back and always access that paperwork that you need. If you don't know exactly where the banking is, um, try to figure it out. What, where do you get mail from? Where do emails come from? You know, you need, you need the paperwork to prove what you have. And it also saves you a lot of money because at the beginning of the divorce process, you're going to fill out two financial forms. One of them is called a schedule of assets and debts, and it's a, basically a snapshot of all your assets and debts. And for that form, you're going to need a backup piece of paper for everything on there. If you have a house, you're going to need the deed and the mortgage. If you have a car, you're going to need the title and any amount owing on it. These are all things you can get ahead of time and save yourself the time and money. What I do have is people come into my office and I, they, I say, OK, I need this financial paperwork. They're like, I don't know. Well, do you know what you have? I don't know. So what I tell people is you need to be aware of your finances within the household, whether you are doing it or not. You need to sit down at least once every six months and just know where everything is. You know, not only for a divorce, when my father died very suddenly, he hadn't gone over all the paperwork was with my mom. So we had to resort to sorting through filing cabinets, trying to figure out what the assets and debts were. Thankfully, my father was a very organized person. So one trip through the filing cabinet and we had everything, you know, except for occasionally we still get a piece of mail with some investment we didn't know about. You don't want to put yourself in that position, whether you're getting divorced or whether something happens to your spouse. Another thing I like to tell people to do is you can get your annual credit report.com. That is your free one that the government allows you to get once a year. So you can find out what debts are in your name. I had a client that just turned everything over to his wife. After he had a heart attack, he let her do everything. She racked up $250,000 in credit card debt that he didn't know about because he never sat down with her to do the paperwork. 
And when they got divorced, uh, did she get re- was she responsible for all of it? What do you think, Jennifer? Nope. That 50, was 50, baby. 50, 50. Yep. yep. Community debt. He was responsible for half that debt, even though he didn't know about it. He didn't sign for any of it. And he didn't charge any of it. So I tell people, if you do, don't do anything else, get that annual free credit report.com from the government. It, it gets you, it's allowed by the government for free. If you get on another website, there's a lot of copycat sites. If they ask you for a credit card number, you're on the wrong site. Get out of there. Go back to the other one. <laughs> so here's the question for you. Um, I had a client whose husband had two or three credit cards in his name only. That's not going to show on her credit report, correct? It could if you're married. It depends on the credit bureau. Sometimes they report it to both and sometimes they don't. Okay. So definitely get that credit just to make sure and see where you're at and get that annually. I do. And plus with all the fraud, that is just a good practice to do anyways, no matter what, like you should know what's happening um, with your credit score. Okay. That's good. So to get statements and banking statements and knowing where things are now. Of course, I have my clients have a monthly money date together so that everyone's on the same page and we're doing financial planning and all of that stuff. However, most of the time you get in a divorce, you're not speaking that great. And normally it's about money. So you're not going to be able to get all of that. So now I do have another client that actually was abused uh, severely. He beat her up. She finally left and she has nothing. She ran out of the house without shoes down the street for her life. Right. So he has everything. Um, She has nothing. She has her ideas of everything that she has, um, but that's all she knows. What do you suggest in that place? Is it up to the other attorney and the spouse to provide that information? It is to provide the initial information because both parties have to fill out that form where you have to attach documentation for everything. That doesn't mean he'll put everything on it. Um, If it's his employer, you can subpoena the employer to get wage and benefit records. Um, if you look at his pay stub, when you get those wage and hour records, you can see if any money is going into a 401k or a savings account or an IRA. Once you're there, then you'll have the bank that you, the bank transfer information. Then you can subpoena the bank statements and find out if money is being transferred in or out from any other places. Oh, that's and good. that's good. And yeah, so there are ways to get it, but they're very expensive. Um, but in those situations, that's an all too common scenario that I deal with. And eventually when they do start paying support, it'll either come from a bank or they'll write them a check. And then you can send a subpoena to that bank for any and all accounts related to this person. Even after the the divorce and you start getting support? Well, well, you'll get temporary support before the divorce is final. Yeah. So once you start getting temporary support, it's either transferred from a bank or it could be directly from his employer. Ideally it is. And then they can't really mess with you on it because that's a, a very common game that abusers like to play is withhold the money. So get, withhold get the and hide and deny. <laughs> and I, I had a jump, I had a client, really nice lady, her ex-husband would take her back for a spousal support modification after the judgment every couple of years. And when they got divorced, he took all the financial paperwork and hid it in the, what were supposedly garbage cans of sand that were holding the pool cover down. So people will go to really extreme lengths to not share. So that's oh why gosh. I recommend people get as much as they possibly can up front. And uh, then we can do detective work. At, in some cases, I've had to employ a private eye, say, go find assets and debts for this person. They'll come back with a report. So there are ways to get it. They're expensive ways. You can save yourself on average eight to $15,000 by having all your paperwork up front. Because it costs just that much extra to find it, do the discovery request, do the demand for production of documents, then do the subpoenas if they don't comply with that. So it's definitely to your benefit to be apprised of all this ahead of time and to have your copies firmly squared away where they can't be bothered. There you go. I love that. Okay. So now we have all our paperwork. Um, Maybe we're just, we, 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 maybe we're just kind of contemplating of what the divorce looks like. I can't tell you how many times, which I know you get as well. So Mm -hmm. many people, the less earner spouse, Mm -hmm. I won't be gender specific, but the less earner spouse has been told that they're going to make nothing. They're going to get nothing. And to divorce would be devastating. And they believe that until they actually meet with an attorney that says, no, 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 50% half. This is what your support would be. This is, um, how do you, when do you recommend someone coming to chat with an attorney for a discovery meeting? 
as soon as possible, as soon as they're thinking about it, because I'm not going to call the other side and say, oh, guess what? They met with me legally. I can't talk to anybody if you come to meet with me. I'm a vault. So just come meet with me. I tell people, just come meet with me. I do charge my hourly rate for it, but I, I refund that to your account if you retain me. I just oh, that's want people great. To have, yeah, I want people to have the proper information. I want people to know their rights. And you left out my favorite one, which is, well, I'll tell them you're a bad mother and they'll never give you the kids if you try to take my money. 100%. Exactly. That's yeah, a big that's one. very and true. It is. So, and I have a top 10 dissolution threat list and why all those things are not true. You know, I'm going to take the kids, you know, if you're an axe murderer, maybe, but I'm pretty sure she's not. So she right. will get end up with custody of the children. You know, it's, it's very difficult to take the children mm -hmm. from any parent. It is. Yes. Very difficult. Yeah, and very and difficult. that's a number one threat people use, especially abusers. And the next is financial control. They'll wipe out all the money. They'll take it all with them and say, too bad, figure it out. You know, we can file for temporary orders to get a support order going so that they do have some income available to them. I have a client right now, the one that's abused, and mm -hmm. their attorney is not filing for temporary support. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. She, I know. I'm like, I don't understand <laughs> this. He I'm has all the me. money, yes. all the checking account, the house, everything, all the assets. She literally ran away with socks, like on her bare feet. She has one suitcase that she went back in with a cop to get out and that's it. And there's no temporary support. She's living on friends, couches, families, couches. Like, I don't understand. I just, and, and there's, I, I just don't even get that. So how do we pick an attorney, Karen? <laughs> not that one that I was just talking about. I can tell you that. Who? Not, not that way. I always tell people that, I mean, if they call me, they're like, Oh, I want to go with you. You know, I'm like, go interview a couple more attorneys because you need to be really comfortable with this person because they are going to be all up in your business and find out a lot of things about you and you need to be comfortable enough with them to be honest because the last thing i want to do is find out about something when i'm sitting at the council table in court because that is not the time to find out about something they're like oh well yeah i didn't it was embarrassing so i didn't say anything so, exactly yeah and i say that about an advisor as well right meet with three different advisors because we're all different we all have we all come to it from from different ways but here's the question for you i that's another reason why i refer you is because i've had people like with this client. It's a, such a huge firm. I think she talked to the attorney one time and it's been five months mm. and she's into it for, I don't even know, seven grand already when they Ouch. told her it'd be like three or 4,000 to get over the whole thing. Cause it's non-contested. Like it's right. really the most simplest thing that I've, I've experienced in divorces. It's like, what do you want? You want, okay, let's go. Like it should not be difficult, but they keep racking up the costs with the aides emailing and texting and or emailing and requesting the same thing five times. And we've already told you we don't have it. So they're billing for all of that. So is there a difference between a small firm or a huge firm? And again, it could just be this one that I'm dealing with right now, mm. but how do you pick the actual attorney? Honestly, it depends on the firm. Um, you wanna go in and if you meet in their office, you wanna see, is their office organized? Is it clean? Um, are, are their papers stacked up? Do they have other people's information? I've actually had people come to me and say, I interviewed an attorney and they had other people's files open on their desk, which is a, a blatant violation of the state bar rules of confidentiality. Um, you look for someone that is responsive. How fast do they respond to you? I mean, if on vacation, obviously you're going to have to wait a week or so, but generally speaking, how fast do they get back to you? I've had big firms who were excellent and I've had big firms such as you described where you know, the client can't get a call back. They can't get any information. I mean, you could have filed a regular motion and had both an order for fees for her attorney's fees and costs and for temporary support, you know, within three months max, you right. know, let alone I, temporary I, I, order. So five months and yeah, it's hard with that. I mean, one thing I will emphasize is you're always entitled to get a second opinion from an attorney at any point in the process. Once you sign up with an attorney, you're not married to that attorney. I, love I would that. encourage okay. you if you're having issues like that, you know, it, it's your relationship. You are in control of that attorney client relationship. Um, I've had some clients that I wouldn't tell them what they wanted to hear. So they went and found an attorney that would good for them. I'm not going to compromise my integrity or, or tell them something that's going to be done at the court. That's not. So. So it, you have important. to. Yeah. And I know your job yeah, is so to. hard because you are the, the truth hammer and we don't right. want to hear that truth hammer. <laughs> Sometimes. Not a lot like, of times they don't. <laughs> nope, they don't. Absolutely. So um, 
Uh, each attorney, can you practice in different counties or states or are you in one county, one state? When you're licensed, you're licensed in that state. I do practice in Contra Costa County and a couple of surrounding counties, but generally speaking, you want someone that's in the county where your case is because you have to pay them to drive to court and that can add up. And also if you're working primarily with the county you work in, you're familiar with the court system and the clerks and how to get things through the process. If you're going out to another county that you don't practice a lot in, then you're not gonna have all those ins and outs. And yes. that can cause some delays. You don't want delays. Yeah, relationship <laughs> and this judge is this and this judge is, yeah, I, I mm -hmm. can totally get that. So you want an attorney in the county, the practice is in the county that you are going to be presiding in. Yeah, Correct. okay, that's Correct. Good. Okay, good. So now we're through the process. I don't even want to talk about the whole process because it will scare the heck out of people that haven't done it because there's so much to it, but it is piece by piece by piece. And so you hold their hand through this piece so they know what's next. You don't give them all the food that they need to eat for the month up front. You give them each day right. at a time is how I say. Oh, they'd and run screaming leave. from the office. I'd give them everything they'd, at once. They'd run screaming from the office. They'd it run. Work for anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I would too. Yeah, you would too. We would too. So the legal process we, we need to understand as much as we need to understand. I can say, again, this is the perfect time for me to be talking about this because I'm dealing with this client. We have no idea what they're doing, what their plan is. We have no idea what's next. We don't know when court is. We don't know anything. Um, and they just keep asking for the same paperwork that we've told them that we don't have like for four months. So um, I think your client they, needs to vote with her feet at this point and go interview a couple more attorneys and get rid of this firm. That would be my, advice. I think so too. Yeah. I think that's what kind of what I'm talking to our kids as well. So that's good. Okay. So the, the next thing is you are always letting the client know exactly what the next step is, right? Like we're doing this to do this. And then that's all they need to know for right now. Right. So then they know right. what paperwork's being happening when it's being filed and then the court date uh, versus you are negotiating with the other attorney possibly sometimes like whatever right. it is but the client should always know exactly what's happening through the process correct and i'll give them an overview it's like, okay this is directly specifically what we need right now but after that year the three or four thing that's going to happen that, that kind of keeps things on track okay i love that and, and now when you enter children into it i mean when i did it we had to go through the mediation process through the courts is that still mandatory that's still the case in California, unless you agree on every single thing, including holidays, exchange times, who picks up at school, what time they pick up, if there's no school, what time they pick up. There's a lot of details that people missed, you know, and one of them is which school district are the children going to go to school in, the dads or the moms if they live in separate school districts. If your order isn't properly structured for that, you could go to register your kids for school and find out you can't. So there wow. are a lot of details that go into it that people never think about. Yeah, for example, yeah. we used to get Christmas orders that would say, okay, mom gets the kids the first half of Christmas break through Christmas Eve. Dad gets them starting at 12 o'clock Christmas Day for the rest of the break. Well, the next year school got out on the 23rd of December. So mom gets three days, dad gets 10. So you have to structure it appropriately to say half the break, you know, this parent gets Christmas Eve, this parent gets Christmas, otherwise they split the days equally. So you don't run into situations like that because the person with 10 days was like, nope, that's what the order says. And then you got to go back to court and spend more thousands of dollars to get this fixed. Correct. And one thing also, a financial thing that people forget to put in there is an annual exchange of tax returns. Because the one thing with child support is once you get that final judgment, there is no retroactivity. So I had a client who said, well, I'll just wait a couple of years, then I'll get a big lump sum but that's not how it works because the dad didn't have notice that she wanted more money. So until she files a motion and serves it on him, the court has no jurisdiction to make those orders. So she lost thousands of dollars. And it's actually kind of funny how that case came about because she asked, she was getting $500 for three children. And she said, can you just chip in $50 for the oldest one's braces? That will really help me out. Um, he did the pound sand, you know, bad words, take me to court, whatever. So we did. We took him to court, so we ended up paying $1,200 a month, plus a percentage of his income over his base income, plus $50 for the orthodontia. So What a dork. Uh, I know, and she lost out on a lot of money uh, because she did not know that there is no retroactivity. You can't just go later and get the money back. It's only from the date you file and serve the motion. So if people have that's a- child supporter, support. That's child support, yes. Okay. For sure. And also with child support, if you remarry and have another child, that actually helps you out 
because you have what is called a hardship for your new biological child and your new spouse's income does not count for the purposes of support. It only counts for what it does for your tax bracket. So if you get remarried and you're in a higher tax bracket, your support will actually go up because you have less taxable, less net income after taxes. And that's completely opposite of what I would have thought. Now, is each state exactly. different? Each state is different, but in, in California, that's how it works. Okay. Wow. So it's very wow. counterintuitive. When I worked for the Department of Child Support Services, you know, people, I did that for two years as well before I switched into family law. And they would come in and say, she got remarried. I insist we rerun it. I'm like, you don't want me to do this, buddy. You really don't want me to do this. And they would insist. And then I'd run it and it ended up exactly how I said it would oddly. And, you know, then they were shocked. <laughs> but oddly. So it's, it, it's very counterintuitive from what you would think. And the same thing if you're paying support and you have another child, your support will actually go down because you do have that half a hardship for the other child in the house, as well as the tax ramifications of your new spouse. So um, people sometimes don't want to remarry because their support will go down. So you're saying that that's not accurate. And no. the other way they do want to remarry if they're paying support because it could go down because now you have another child. Right. Okay. Okay. That's good. I love that. Okay. So how, what's your longest divorce? How long is it your longest time getting, take, getting a couple through the process? From start to finish, uh, I think it was about five years and oddly they had no property in common. They had no children in common, but it was an abuse case. And if he could keep delaying the process, he could keep controlling what she could do. Yep. So that one I've went on way twice. too long. There are things I could file to move the case forward. And she's like, no, no, no. We'll just see if we can work it out. I don't want to spend the money to go to court. Um, but we could have finished that much sooner had she, you know, let me take the gloves off as it were and file the motions to push it through the court. Yeah. That was just the attack sometimes. she wanted to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that. I totally get that. Okay. Well, so scary. I mean, you want to yeah. resolve it between yourselves if you can, because otherwise you're throwing it to a stranger up on the bench who has reviewed your file once and is going to make a decision about your children and your finances going forward. So I always tell people, if you can resolve it between yourselves, do. It's much better for you, much less stressful. Uh, but like I said, there are cases where they need to hear it from the judge. And I have. So I'm going to add, mm -hmm. I'm going I'm to add in there real quick. Do mm -hmm. not try to do it yourself until you meet with an attorney mm -hmm. to tell you what your, what you should be getting. Because there's Correct. so many women that try mm -hmm. to do it themselves and they're accepting 25% of what they should actually be receiving. Correct. I mean, and you can go back and modify support after that, but it's difficult. You have to have a change of circumstances. So I can also, right. um, I recommend if you're doing it yourself, have an attorney in your back pocket where you're just going to consult about things. I yes. also do mediations. And for every mediation, I tell both clients, I'm here to help you mediate, not give you legal advice. I want you to each go meet with an attorney during the process to find out if what we're doing is fair for you. Um, thankfully, I've never had any marital settlement agreements I've drafted come back with any big changes because we work towards what is fair. Uh, but, well, and plus, yes. you know the law mm -hmm. as well. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there are people that think they know the law. I had one case where a guy submitted his judgment on his own, figured it was done, but the judgment was rejected and he didn't know that. And he went and got remarried. So when she wanted to divorce him five years later, it was considered a bigamous marriage. So there was no community property created. So half of her investments, half of all that, he didn't get any of it. So <laughs> this is why we say do it yourself, but make sure if you want to do it yourself, that's fine. There are attorneys that can assist you through the process. I have very reliable document preparers I work for. If you don't want to spend a lot of money, I have great document preparers that I could refer you to that can do the paperwork to make sure it's correct. Then you can pay an attorney for an hour to look it over and then submit it to the court. I mean, there are ways to get help without it costing thousands and thousands of dollars. Oh, I love that. So there's so many different variations, which I've experienced as well. That's really, really good. That's good. Correct. And oh, what I might okay. suggest for your one client that you're having all the issues with is they have most courts have a family law facilitator that are attorneys employed by the court that will help you for free. So she should check into that in whatever county she in is, is in and First, she'd have to ditch the attorney and go in and say, hey, I really need support. Can you help me with this paperwork? And they will help her get that drafted and filed. Yeah. Uh, her spouse doesn't even have an attorney. Okay. So she could do the same thing. That's what I was saying. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. She's the one that should do it. Yeah. She should go in and say, I want to use a facilitator and, and just get some immediate help. 
Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so now I know we could talk about child custody and all the ins and outs. We'll have to do another mm -hmm. podcast on that because there's a crap right. ton there. So let's go to property division. I know we're in California. We're 50-50. What when have you seen? Oh, here's here's one for you. Okay, so uh, one one person comes in with say you know a hundred thousand dollars and puts it down. They're married. He comes in with a hundred thousand, mm -hmm. puts it down on their very first home. They they're both on the home. They get the loan. No, no, no. Now it's, you know, three, four homes later. And that hundred thousand dollars is just rolled over to all those homes. Um, legally, uh, does he have to get that hundred thousand dollars back? It depends on how many times it's been rolled over. after it's been rolled over a, a couple of times. It's just all pretty much considered community. Uh, That's what I thought. Would, right. And they do have actuaries that will calculate if someone puts a separate property down payment into a home, how much of that home is community, how much is separate. And I have companies that I use for that, that I use all the time. And they'll send you a nice detailed report on, you know, X number of dollars is community. That's what you have to split. You know, X so number this of dollars my, is separate. That makes totally sense. Now this, they, this was rolled over like they've been married like 25 years or something. So mm -hmm. it's been rolled over several times. Um, and she, out of the goodness of her heart, said, you're right. You came in with that money. You know, I'm fine with that. And that was in the beginning of all the negotiations of everything. Right. And so mm -hmm. then they end up finalizing everything. And now the first payment for support and um, child to both the both supports are there. Maintenance and support, whatever they call it. Mm -hmm. And now he's mad. So now he starts playing games about all this other stuff. And she's like, I wish I would have never given him that money <laughs> because she did that out of the goodness of her heart, which she did not have to do. And now he's making her life miserable. So yeah, if, I know. If, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I know it's hard. Like you can't tell who's going to do what, but in my experience of I'm probably just into several hundred divorces or people going through <laughs> divorces, I've had maybe um, 20% go the way we thought it would. <laughs> exactly. I say the first thing you should probably erase from your vocabulary is, well, they would never. Because yeah. you don't know until you get into the process. And people use finances to control. I mean, you can agree to anything you want and the court will sign off on it as long as it's reasonable. So the fact she agreed to the 100000 and gave it back, that's fine. Um, she can go to the Department of Child Support Services and have them enforce support to put a third party in between the two of them so that he can't harass her as much. Well, he everything he's doing is almost legal. I'd say 80% of it is almost, mm -hmm. it's just the other that it's like nitpicking, but it's racking up to be several thousand dollars of different things. So it's just unfortunate because I was trying to, you know, I was trying, I was trying to tell him this <laughs> is going to happen. Um, and then she's like, you're right. Everything you said is right. It's happening. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, well, guess what? You're single now. And so now we get to work on that part. <laughs> right. Okay. So for, property for sure. division, does it matter if it does? I mean, no, I know we're in California, but mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if they're on the deed of the house. It doesn't matter if they're on the credit card. It doesn't matter if they're on the car. It doesn't matter. You're in a marriage, sure. whoever has whatever they have, they're responsible for every debt and every everything. Let's say they get, they get in a fight, they move out, they get their own apartment, whatever they're not filed at all, whatever this spouse does, you're liable for, correct? Correct. Until you file, and let me ask you this, can you file for separation and stop the financial as well as filing for divorce? Does that stop the growth of it? Well, those are two separate processes. The only time I would say you would file for a legal separation, it used to be if there was a health insurance issue, but now with covered California, that's generally not the case. Or if you think there's some point of reconciling, because they are two separate procedures. They both come with a $435 in this county filing fee. And you'll have to start all over again if you then decide to file for divorce. But when you file okay. for divorce, you're going to have a date of separation on the petition. And that's the date that you cease being liable for what they're doing. Now, if you have a community asset and somebody trips and falls in your front yard, you're still a joint owner of that home. So they can still come after you for that sort of thing. But if he goes and racks up, um, if goes by the Maserati, you're not responsible after the date of separation on the divorce. 
Yeah, that's on him. And if he goes and uses community property as a down payment, you can go try to take part of his Maserati from him and get your down payment back, at least your half of it. <laughs> I want half of that Maserati. <laughs> okay. I love that. Okay. Um, how does the court look at um, at home, staying at home, raising the fam family versus the breadwinner in well, there, the divorce? Uh, it's basically just a formula. There's a code section that has 14 factors that go into what is spousal support. Child support is just a formula created by the legislature. It's numbers in, numbers out. The judge can't even change it unless the two parties agree or there's certain really low income guidelines. Spousal support has 14 factors and the court can go anywhere with that, you know, such as did you stay home to raise the children so they could advance in their career? Did you support their education? Was there domestic violence? What assets do you have available after the divorce? What is your earning capacity after the divorce? If you supported a, a spouse through school and you didn't go to school and then you never went back to school because you were raising the children. Those are all the factors they look at that determine support. How does so abuse come into play? It's one of the factors in spousal support, and it, it's a pretty big factor as far as. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Okay, let's talk more about that. <laughs> so let's say okay, this client, right, mm -hmm. physically abused, went to the hospital, spent a week in the hospital, broke her ribs, broke her, mm -hmm. you know, all this, you know, all that stuff. And he went to jail and got out the next day um, on a misdemeanor, even though the cops had to put her in the ambulance. Right. Somehow now it's a misdemeanor and he's at home in their house. No problem. Not changing his life at all. And she's in the hospital. So clearly it was abused. Does she, uh, and it's, uh, he was the breadwinner. She's on disability already mm -hmm. from all the other previous abuses. Okay. And she wants, we are thinking, I was thinking 50, 50 of everything, but are you saying that that could be different because of the no, abuse? property property's 50, 50, but they will look when they're awarding spousal like support. support, spousal support. Yeah. Like I said, it doesn't affect child support because that's numbers in numbers out, but spousal yeah. support, one of those 14 factors is abuse. And that's okay. something the court will take a look at to make sure that that person can live you know, at least comfortably, nobody's going to live at the standard. And you know, the, the code section says yeah. you'll live at the standard of living during the marriage. You're now living in two households, what you used to live in on one. So that's kind of a fantasy, but we yeah. want to make sure everybody is comfortable and can get by. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. I and, love that. And, and as far as dividing the property, I, I just help it, people like it. It's a pie. You can slice it up however you want, as long as it's about equal. You know, we have a spreadsheet, yeah. we put everything in, we have what the husband keeps, what the wife keeps, we get to the bottom line. Okay, spouse one owes spouse two X number of dollars to equalize it, okay? Do we want to do that or do we want to move some assets around so it's a little more equal? And so that's where I come in as a CDFA because mm -hmm. I'm looking at long-term planning for either both of them, if they're both my clients, I do a lot of joint work or, you know, my client to make sure that, do you want the real estate? Do you want the equity in the real estate? Do you want the 401k or do you want the cash now? Like what's your tax ramifications down the road and how's that going to help you build your life? If you have no income now and you're going to have support and um, alimony for say eight, nine years, mm -hmm. what's going to happen after that? If you cannot create income, that's getting you your six figures that the alimony and support is going to be giving you. What happens after that? when you're still in your forties and you can't touch your retirement accounts until you're 60, like sometimes that stuff's not looked at individually by the person. So that's where I come in as the CDFA consultation for long-term planning. Well, that's why it's great having a person like you, because a lot of people get really attached to the house because they think the kids will stay with them if they keep the house. I mean, the reality is if you're a matter of a fact about it and comfortable, the kids will be comfortable wherever you are. And I see 100%. And you see more people trying to keep a house that's just going to be an albatross around their neck. It's like, yes, you can afford the house payment. Are you ever going to Disneyland? Are you ever going to the movies? And you're basing yep. this on support that, like you said, you may get for a few years and then it's gone. So you have to plan for that. Can you save that support? And yep. you may not be able to. Hold on, get a drink real quick. Sorry. 
So what I do with that is because I know a hundred percent of my clients have all sold that house. No one has stayed in it. And so I already know when I'm splitting their assets and I'm looking at all of that, that I know that I want that equity. I know that that equity in that house is going to come out in the next year or two. And then what am I going to do with that? So I'm always looking at that because I know they're not, they're just not going to be able to stay in that house. They're not going to want to, but we all think we, we need to. And this brings me to my next topic with you is the mm-hmm. emotional and psychological well being of the client. Now, this is another reason why I like you personally, because you've mm-hmm. been through it, you know it, mm-hmm. um, you can care for the client for, to a large extent. Um, not that that's part of your job on the emotional side of things. That's mm-hmm. another reason why I have the CDFA actually is very helpful because I can, I can look at the psychological and I can hold the hands and spend the time more on that and get them to agree to this agreement, but take them through the psychological beliefs and old beliefs and new beliefs and get them empowered to where their new life is going to be through this divorce process where there's no way an attorney has time for any of that. Where you're just trying to get this done and save everyone a lot of money and stress and time. So that's where another way a CDFA comes in. But how does that, how do you handle their emotions? Like we are psycho when we're going through a divorce, no matter how easy it is. We literally, our soul and our brain has left our body. That's entirely true. And I was like that myself when I was getting divorced and I had all my legal education at that point. So I think it helps that I can say, I know exactly where you've been. It's going to be okay. And I do tell all my clients, because you said some of them are overly nice, like your client with the $100,000 she gave back. I said, there's kind of a line, there's nice. And then on the other side, it's stupid. It's my job to keep you on the side of the line where you're being nice, but you're not going over into giving up something that you really did not have to give up. And yeah, emotionally, but- that's why it's so great to have a resource like you, because I can send them to you for the nuts and bolts of what's my future look like. I can't tell you how many people want, oh, I'll keep the house. He can keep his retirement. It's like, but wait, let's take a look at this a second because you haven't been working the last 20 years. You do not have social security built up. If he has a pension and you're turning down that pension, or if he has a 401k and you're turning down that investment opportunity, where does that leave you when you're 60, 65? And you go to apply for social security and you get $500 a month because that's all you've earned. So we get half of his as long as, all the parameters. So we plan for that. So going through a divorce, you really do Mm -hmm. need to meet with the financial planner. um, Preferably me, of course, because I'm kind of bad. Of course. And um, (laughs) right. And (laughs) like plan, plan the rest of your life to make sure that this money and, and what you're doing, because there is a lot, like you said, it is a pie and there's a lot of negotiations here and there because and I've been on both sides of the pie, right? The breadwinner and the non breadwinner. Right. Have I ever been? Yes, I have. Well, <laughs> not really. I think I'm always the breadwinner, but that's okay. I've been equal and the breadwinner. So <laughs> I know the tax ramifications of that as well. So we definitely like like dependents, like who takes the children as dependents? How, how do you see that happening most of the time? Most of the time, if there's more than one child, each takes one. And then the language they forget a lot of the time is that when the first one ages out, you alternate years with the other one. Oh. Sometimes there's a really high wage earner and a really low wage earner. And it is better for the high wage earner to take it. But you want to look out for is that is one of the factors when they calculate child support. So if they're claiming the children as dependents on their taxes and then running the child support as if the other parent is claiming them, they're actually cheating and not paying as much as they should be. And vice versa, you need to make sure when you fill out that form for the support that whoever is keeping those dependents on their taxes, that's how it's listed when they calculate child support. Otherwise, they're getting both because you either pay less in support and get the deductions or you pay more in support and don't get the deductions, but they're double dipping if they kind of shift it to do it both ways. Oh, that's good. That's good. And that's another little thing that people just don't even think to ask. They don't even know to ask that. They would never, I would, I didn't even know to do that. I, I, I like, well, again, the higher wage earner to have (laughs) because they get more of that deduction, but what are you going to give the lower wage earner, like there's got to be a give and take. Right, it is. Well. And if you put if you put it in the in the support calculations that that person is keeping the dependents, they will be paying more monthly to the parent that is not taking them as dependents. Okay, that's good. Awesome. Okay, so now you mentioned earlier health insurance benefits. I know a lot of people, like the abused one, did not she she does not going to pay for her own health 
insurance now. There's no way she's going to be able to afford $1,200 a month um, or whatever it is in her, in her county. So do people stay, can they file for divorce, go through the process and not become finalized for like another year or two until this person gets on their feet? They can, they can, they can do that. Or you can also ask for additional spousal support to cover the amount of the health insurance. That's another way you can handle that issue. Unless if they don't have that money, then they can stay. It depends on how much money they have, if they can do that. Right. And one of the standard family law restraining orders when you file for divorce is you cannot change any of that during the divorce process. So if someone does try to change a beneficiary or take money out of a joint account, a big sum, or if they try to drop your health insurance in the middle of the divorce proceedings, that's a huge violation. And that's something that their attorney should be addressing right away. And they do that often, actually. And I'm going to add in, since I'm a life insurance pro person, they do the mm -hmm. same thing with life insurance. And so this is one of my things that I, I know I work with you on all the time. I love it to make sure that this, that the clients um, that are receiving this, the support have a life insurance policy. And if you can, some type of a disability policy on that wage earner spouse and making sure you are the beneficiary for what equates to your life and span and money of the support, child support or maintenance support, alimony, whatever you want to call it. So that if something happens to that person, your life is not affected. Now, I know you can negotiate who's going to pay that premium. I guess mm -hmm. it depends on each situation. And we had a case uh, together that was crazy. He was not nice person. And he knew the ins and outs of insurance. So, And I was the agent. So he told me that he was now all of a sudden a smoker and a rock climber and a race car driver and all this crazy stuff. So she's paying like five times the amount of the life insurance premium to have the life insurance on him because he's the wage earner, but there's no other choice. Like you have to do that. So here is what I request that this application and the life insurance has to be, be during the divorce process, because we did not start that until after the divorce was final. Mm -hmm. So in order for her to go back and hold his feet to the fire, she would have cost her several thousand dollars, which was not worth it. So to any divorce attorneys out there or any people thinking about mm -hmm. this, start the life insurance so that it's finalized before the divorce is finalized. So he or she cannot play those stupid games when you're getting the life insurance. That's right. And if, they're not, and if they're not paying for the policy themselves, I tell them to at least provide annual proof of, that the policy is still in effect and that that person remains the beneficiary. And if they don't provide that, how do you do that inexpensively require them to provide it? Uh, it's no inexpensive way to require them to do it. That's you can what I thought. have an attorney send a very sternly word, but that's basically contempt of court. So you can take them that can actually end up being a quasi criminal proceeding. So you want to, you know, if they're really belligerent, you may have to do that. But usually a letter from an attorney is like, hey, you have to provide this or you could and normally, the insurance company in themselves. And normally that's if they're helpful. doing that, they're doing a lot of other things. You're probably going to have to take them back to court anyways. Pretty I'm much. Yeah. Just do that. <laughs> Yeah, they're yeah, not going to pick one. It's usually the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So how many? We're, we got one minute left. How many times can you take somebody back to court for support or for, for anything? anything? Can you? You can take them back to court. It's once every three years for support, unless there's a change of circumstances, which is change in income, uh, got remarried, had another baby. You know, somebody's working, having more income, that sort of thing. Uh, as far as once the judgment is final on the property, it's done. So okay. You can't go back to court on that, but for the support and the custody of visitation, you can go back until the children are 18 or 19, as long as they're still a full-time enrolled high school student. So what if you, like this gal with a hundred thousand, what if they signed mm -hmm. the divorce mm -hmm. papers? Wait, no, I don't even know. Yeah. They just signed the divorce papers on the property settlement and all of that, but they're not getting the divorce for two more years because of health, can she go back and change that? Depend on if the property was settled as that part of it. I mean, once there's an order for it, it's an order and they like court likes finality of orders, especially when it comes to a divorce. Okay, so once an order, it's an order. You said so many things here that are so gold, <laughs> Karen, I can't even tell you. I so appreciate what you do. Uh, this is a stressful job, a stressful industry, and I love the way you go to bat and you fight like hell for your clients, and I totally appreciate that. So thank you so much for being on my podcast today and sharing your wisdom with us. Well, thank you for having me. Great to see you. You too, my love. Right. Talk to all you right. soon. I want all of your clients.
wants to be able to say, I rocked my finances before All right, sounds good to me. after the divorce. Excellent. Thank you. Bye, sweetie. Bye-bye. We appreciate you joining us today and don't forget to subscribe to the Rock My Finances YouTube channel for more engagement and bonus content. Tell me, what is your money story? Let's find out with Jennifer, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, every Thursday right here on K4HD Radio and Talk 4 TV. It's not about the zeros, it's about the F word, feelings. Feelings Jennifer can't wait to explore with you next week. Until then, let's all say, I rock my finances.